root Google and you type the fetus dot net. Okay? And then you get over here, the fetus dot net. And then you go to the bottom of the page and it says DVD fetal echocardiography, the normal examination. And you click on that get this screen. You put your email and it will send you a link and you can download the whole lecture. It's very big, it's at least 3 gigabytes and it only works on PC, not Macintosh, only on PC. So you will have to review it three or four times before you know all of it. But don't get discouraged. Free education, you have to take advantage, okay? So let's go back to our dextral position. So, in the baby that has dextrocardia, the apex of the heart is on the right side. In the normal baby, the apex is on the left side. In dextral position, the heart is on the right side. But look at the apex. The apex is pointing to the front or pointing to the left side. So the big difference is the cardia, it's pointing to the right side, the position is pointing to the front. So here we have mesocardia, the axis of the heart is aligned with the anterior posterior line of the baby. So what are the findings in dextrocardia? This is an anomaly of embryological folding. The heart is rotated to the right side, it's not shifted to the right side, and the cardiac axis points to the right. Important to look at that. And the cardiac position does not change during the gestation. So here we have two babies, both with the effects of the heart on the right side. Which of these two babies has the greatest likelihood of a cardiac anomaly? The one on the left side? Or the one on the right side? Who's his left side? Raise your hand. Good, I see a few hands. Who's his right side? Raise your hand. Okay, only 4% of you are answering, but those of you answering are answering correctly. This baby has dextrocardia, so 95% chance of a cardiac anomaly. This baby has Cytosis versus 2% chance of cardiac anomaly. Okay? So don't look just at the heart, also look at the stomach. Now, not only you have to think about dextrocardia and cytosis versus, but you also have to think about the heterotaxis syndrome. And I think tomorrow we'll talk about heterotaxis syndrome. So, what are the causes of dextrocardia, cardiac malformation, and the heterotaxis syndrome? Okay? So here we have left side, right side. How many cardiac chambers do you see here? One, two, three, four. Not four. Maybe two. One big atrium, one big ventricle. Okay? So the heart is on the left side. The I'm sorry, the heart is on the right side. The apex is on the right side. Two cardiac chambers. What else is abnormal in this view? Anything abnormal? I told you to look at everything on the film. How about the descending aorta? Is it a normal descending aorta? No, it's in the middle. It should be on the left side, it's in the middle. Okay? How about this baby? It's Friday, 5 o'clock. You have to go to your children, get your children at the daycare center, and you see this picture. This is the left side, this is the right side. Four chamber, normal? Not normal. Which of these two ventricles is the longest? The front one. So the front one is the left ventricle. This is the moderate band, so this is the right ventricle. Okay? This atrium here received the pulmonary vein. Although this pulmonary vein here is not very committed. But so this is the left atrium. And this is the left ventricle. So the ventricles are inverted. 
but the atrial ventricle are concordant, okay? And you see, it's the largest in all of the chamber. Now, in dextral position, the heart is shifted to the right, maybe even hugging the chest wall. So you're looking for a space occupying lesion on the left side of the chest. And typically, what you're looking for is a left diaphragm area, a cystic adenomatoid malformation of the lung, congenital lower visima, left core effusion, cardiothorax, cardiac tumor, or amniogenesis. Okay? Now, here we have a, a section, we see the stomach on one side, we see the heart on the other side, the axis of the heart is oriented with the midline. So this is a left diaphragm hernia. The diaphragm hernia will kill the baby just as well as any cardiac anomaly, so it's important to recognize that. This is a baby that has a large, wide, left lung. This is cystic adenomyelitis malformation of the lung. You see the heart is pushed to the right side, but also the mediastinum. You see the aura and the acidus vein are also shifted to the right side. And here we have a large left core effusion. The heart is on the right side, the mediastinum is on the right side. You see that in all these three cases, the apex of the heart is pointing to the front, not to the right side, like in the dextrocardia that I showed you in the slide before. The front, not to the right side. So, important distinction. Also, notice that behind the heart, you can see the right lung. Okay. Compare with this baby, behind the heart, you don't see the right lung. And the cardiac views are all normal. This is a baby that has right lung in genesis. So when the baby is born, it will have a very ugly chest x-ray. But some of these babies do actually pretty well. So don't get confused between dextroposition and dextrocardia. So, aorta on the left side, aorta on the right side. So, you can have apex on the left side, apex on the right side, you said aorta on the right or on the left. So, you have to pay attention to all these different uh, situations. And if it's not the usual situation, look for an anomaly. So, again, here the uh, aorta is in the middle, here the aorta is on the right side. So, in these two babies, suspect a cardiac anomaly. And these are not something very obvious. If you read the exam too fast, you will not see that. You have to think, where is the descending aura? Where is this? Where is that? The aura is in the middle, the apex is on the left side. How about this heart? Where is the apex? In the middle. Why not this abnormal with this heart? Left and right should be equal. Are they equal? The right is too big. AV valves, the same level. How about the pulmonary veins? Do the pulmonary vein go to the left atrium or do the pulmonary vein go in between? They go in between, so they're not committed to the left atrium. And the descending ur is frankly on the right side. Okay? So although this is a full chamber with four chambers, this is not a normal view at all. Okay? If you look at right-sided aortic arch, trumpus arteriosus 50%, tetrosia 25, homotresia 25, and right ventricle 20%. These are all connectional anomalies. So if you see a right side aortic arch, always think of connectional anomalies. Normal or abnormal? The baby on the left, on the right side. Axis of the heart, 90 degree, descending aura on the right side. If you read some article that says the four chamber view is not a good screening tool for cardiac anomaly because it doesn't detect output track anomalies, but if you don't look at all the findings of the four chamber view, yes, that's true, but if you look at all the findings, you can detect many output track anomalies. This is the stomach, this is the descending aura. What is this? IVC. Normal or abnormal? Who says normal? 
Who says I'm normal? Very good. This is the four chamber view of the heart. This is the dissimura. This is who says IBC? No one says IBC? You're right. You cannot have the IBC behind the heart because by definition the IBC drains into the right atrium. So if you see this, for sure the baby has IBC interaction with azicose continuation. So probably left heterotaxis syndrome. Remember that as you go from the low to the high abdomen, the IVC is moving anterior into the liver because it has to go and join the right atrium. So if you see IVC next to the spine, this is never a normal IVC. So here we have the disseminura, and I'm just below the four chamber view. What is the vessel between the descending ura and the four chamber? Anyone who's good at anatomy? You didn't like to study anatomy either, huh? Neither did I. Well, there should be no vessel between the ura and the four chamber. And so I make it disappear. What was that? Photoshop? Not Photoshop. This is the esophagus. Baby swallow fluid, and you see the fluid go through these fingers. That's a normal finding. Another one here, aorta, is a fingers, azicus. And the baby in which you see that the most are baby they have, trisomy 21, and duodenotresia, because they swallow fluid, they have a big distended duodenum, and then they vomit the whole thing, and so you see the fluid coming in and coming out. Okay? It's a normal finding. The lesson is that any tube next to the heart is not necessarily a vessel. It could be the esophagus or the trachea. So here we have, behind the heart, you see the esophagus here, and you see it going to the stomach. It's normal finding. This is the thymus. Okay? Now, this is an image I like very much. You have just seen that the new medicine machine here has 256 crystals and 256 grayscales. This is a machine from 1982. It had 64 crystals and 16 grays of scale. This is the head of the baby. This is the chest of the baby. This black line here is either a jugular vein, in which case you would go to the supernicaba, or it is a forward artery. And it connects to this vessel here, which is an arch, and that arch is coming right behind the sternum. So this baby has transposition of the great arteries. And I like this picture because sometimes people come to me and say, Oh, Philippe, you have all the expensive machines, so of course you can make the good diagnosis. I have this crappy little machine that the government is giving me, and I cannot make the diagnosis. Don't think like that. You may not be able to get all the fine details, but this is a machine that none of you want to use. And still, in 1982, we could make a diagnosis. And as I look at you, I see many of you were not even born in 1982. You were still follicles. So don't get discouraged because you have a bad machine. Try to look at a new, good one, but if you don't have it, you can still make diagnosis. So here I'm going through the aortic arch, and you see the aortic arch with the brachycephalic arteries, and underneath you see the pulmonary veins, and then we're going to turn, and now we see the azygos arch. That's a normal finding, and under the azygos you see the right pulmonary and the right pulmonary vein. Remember the pulmonary is more cephalic than the vein, and since the velocity is higher, the diameter is smaller than the pulmonary vein. And then if you keep scanning and you make a cross-section at this level here, you get an image in which you see the azicus arch entering in the back of the supernumerica, and this is the azicus arch. No more fighting. And these two black dots here are the two main stem bronchi, left and right main stem bronchi. So in the first step, what we did was very, very simple. No one can miss that. We look at the apex, the heart, the stomach, the descending aura, 
and all of them should be on the left side. Now, in the second step, we're going to start looking at the heart in itself. And what we're going to do is look at the chambers. We want to see that there are four chambers. We want to see that the atria are connected to the proper ventricles, that there is concordance. We want to see the ventricular and the atrial septum. And we want to see the insertion of the atrioventricular valves. So, I show you this, we can skip. Remember the right ventricle is shorter and you have this offset between the tricuspid and the mitral valve. The second defect, I've shown you that. So here we have really a normal heart. This heart is left axis deviated. You see the interval receptor is at 90 degree and we have a very large right side. And you see a tricuspid valve which is very abnormal. Now this could be one of two things. It could be a tricuspid dysplasia with a lot of regurgitation, or it could be an Epstein anomaly. And actually, this is an Epstein anomaly, and you can see that with cardiopathy. In tricuspid dysplasia, you will have cardiac regurgitation from the middle of this chamber here, which is a right ventricle in tricuspid dysplasia. But in Epstein anomaly, this is the atrialized portion of the right ventricle, all that. The right ventricle is just a tiny slit at the apex over here. So this is Epstein anomaly with massive regurgitation. Now this is something very important because in the fetus we have something different from the pediatric and the adult circulation. If my mitral valve gets obstructed, my whole heart is going to enlarge. In the pediatric and the adult circulation, obstruction results in dilatation. That's not true in the fetus. If you have struck one side in the fetus, you have two bypasses through the formula body and through the ductus. So in fetuses, obstruction usually does not, there's some exception, but usually does not result in distension, dilatation. Dilatation in the fetus results from regurgitation. So when blood goes back and forth through the AV valve, this causes distension of the chambers, and that's when you have the HT. Here we have a tricuspid atresia in which the valve is too ecogenic. The blood cannot go from the left the right atrium to the right ventricle, it goes to the left atrium, left ventricle, and this baby has a large muscular septal defect, and therefore we have some flow in the right ventricle. So if you do a three vessel view in color, how many cars are you going to see? One color or two colors? No, not two, one, exactly. You'll see one because you will have forward flow in the aura and forward flow in the pulmonary. But you'll see that the pulmonary will be much thinner than the aura. Here we have no atrioventricular valve and no structure inside the middle of the heart during diastole. And this is very classical of the atrioventricular septal defect, the complete form you can see over here. Nothing in the middle of the heart. Even at 10 weeks, you can see this baby has bradycardia, which is common in atrioventricular septal defect, and you see a communication between the right and the left ventricle. This baby has hydrox, it was there for leukoleucensis screening, no need to do leukoleucensis screening. The baby has trisomy 21, and the mother can make a decision about the pregnancy. There's a few intracardiac membranes that you have to be aware of. One is a, a large foramen ovarian flap that is called an atrial septal annulus. You see the foramen ovarian flap is much larger than normal and it goes at least halfway through the left atrium. You see this baby also has tricuspid atresia with a ventral septal defect and a hypoplastic right ventricle. So atrial septal annulus. Another one you can see is a quarter atrial. Remember I told you about the veins joining the back of the left atrium and sometimes you can see this remnant of a membrane over here. Now, in the fetus this is usually not a problem because the fetal circulation, fetal lung circulation is low flow, not the small flow. But when the baby is born, the patent orifice here may be restricted and so this baby may develop torture atriaturally. So those babies need to be rescanned after birth. 
This one is a coronary sinus, and you see this baby coronary sinus is normal or too big? This is normal. This is too big? Yeah, of course. This is a baby that has persistent left supranal cava with drainage into the coronary sinus. So you want to investigate that baby for uh, isomerism. This is hard to see and it's not common. This is an open mitral valve and there's a thin membrane in front, a pre-mitral diaphragm, which is associated with trisomy 21. This on the right atrium, you see this little bump inside the uh, frontal aspects of the right atrium. This is called a Chiari net. This is a common uh, variant. 1% of the population has a Chiari net. So it's not uh, something to consider abnormal. And if you see something similar on the left uh, atrium, think about the Kumadin ridge. So you can have something on the right, <coughs> something on the left side. This is the eustachian valve into the uh, left atrium, and you see the aortic valve and pulmonary uh, valve. And sometimes the eustachian valve can be quite large. This is the valve of Tibesius at the end of the coronary sinus, also a normal finding. Don't confuse that with something at home. If you look at the motion of the fragmental valley, it has a double excursion. You have one excursion during the systole, and then you have another excursion during the atrial contraction. So you have to see this double motion of the uh, fragmental valley flap, and if you see only one single motion, then the baby has an atrial septal aneurysm. If you look at ventricular septal defect and you look in an apical view, which is what we often use when we do field echo, the interventricular wall is going to be almost parallel to the marginal beam. And if the beam is parallel, it has no interface to the fragment. So the machine will have no signal to write, and the machine will write a 12 bar artifact. It would put a black hole that looks like a ventricular septal defect. So avoid doing an apical view, go instead in a transcostal view, and now you are perpendicular to the interventional septum, and then you have a good reflector. The problem is that the majority of ventral septum defects are more narrow than the width of the beam. So the edge of the beam are going to be touching the edge of the uh, septal defect, and the machine will arc average in those echo, and cover the fact that there is a ventricular septal defect. So what is the solution for that? You paid good money for that. You have to use it. You press on the button, call a doctor. And the car doctor will have a double shift here, which is perfectly aligned with a septum, with a beam of ultrasound. You will have maximal double shift and you will have the best possible resolution for ventricular septal defect. So always do car doctor on intercostal views of the uh, septum to look for ventricular septal defect. Now, if there was truly a septal defect, there would be a crest at the top of the septum. And that crest can return a very tiny echo. And if you pay attention to that, you will see a little white dot at the end of the interventor septum. And that white dot tells you that this is really an interface, and this baby truly has a ventricular septal defect. So be on the lookout for this little white dot over here. Now both ventricles are working against the same resistance, and since they're working against the same resistance, they have about the same size. In the fetus, the right ventricle can be up to 20% larger than the left ventricle. So a little bit of right ventricle preference there. But if you see something like this, in which the left ventricle is 9 millimeter and the right ventricle is 18 millimeter, this is really outside the normal range. And the first thing to look at at this time is to look for the aortic arch and see if you see a defect in the back of the aortic arch. This is very classical of partition of the aorta. This is another example, another of these old images from 1982. And this was my professor John Hobbins, a wonderful person. And uh, when you have asymmetry of the ventricle, most of the time, it is because the section is not equatorial to both ventricles, so you have to correct for that. But if this is the best you can get, then it's abnormal. And he decided to do an immunosynthesis on this baby, and the baby had trisomy 18. 
Now, in 1982, we didn't know that having the AV valves at the same level was a sign of atrial intercephalic defect, which is, of course, a big indicator of trisomy 18. Uh, so, but now we know that. But in 1982, this is the only thing we knew. So if you see an asymmetry like this, there's a long list of differential diagnoses of causes for that. But by far the most common here is coarctation of the aura. Now, look at the position of the ventricle. Here we have the two ventricles, normal or abnormal. The short ventricle is posterior, the long ventricle is anterior. The AV valve closer to the apex is the posterior AV valve instead of the anterior AV valve. So here we clear have the inversion of the ventricle. And this is the right ventricle on the posterior aspect. This is the left ventricle on the anterior aspect. This is an atrium that receives the four-way veins. So this has to be the left atrium. And the left atrium is connected to the right ventricle. What is this condition? This is the l transposition of the great artery. This is what is supposed to call the congenitally corrected transposition of the great artery. Remember I told you before of the detransposition, and then I may cover this tomorrow also. In the detransposition, the four chamber view is normal, this is the outflow track, which is abnormal. In the L transposition, the four chamber view is very abnormal, and so is the outflow track. Sometimes we have two few chambers. Here we have a large common atrium because the interatrial septum is missing. This is essentially a Austin secundum uh, type of defect. Or you have nothing in between because again we have a common form of atrial receptor defect. Or you may have a single ventricle. Here we have one single ventricle, there's almost no interventricular receptor. But you see we have two AV valves. This is the transmit valve, this is the mitral valve. So this is a double index single ventricle. Which Vietnamese animal has a double index single ventricle? You know it. The frogs. Frogs have a double index single ventricle. And this is something that always shocked me. If I was to design a pump, would I design the inside of the pump smooth and the outside irregular, or would I design the inside of the pump irregular and the outside smooth? Well, the answer is easy. You look in your motor, all the motors have the inside of the cylinder extremely smooth and the outside of the motor very bumpy. Well, we have trophic collection because frogs did not have an interventional receptor, so they could not separate the right side circulation from the left side circulation. They had deep trophic and each atria was discharging into the trophication of that side. And by a differential mechanism of contraction, the left side of the ventricle was ejecting into the aorta, and the right side into the artery. And this is the reason why we have deep trophication inside our heart. Sometimes you have a missing chamber, and missing chamber means that this area of the heart did not perfuse. If you have a trigospin atresia here, with no ventricle septal defect, so different from the one actually before, there is no blood that can go into the right ventricle, and the right ventricle does not develop. If you do the three vessel view with color, you will have two color. One color for the ura, and the opposite color for the pulmonary. Here we have a two chamber heart. We have one large atrium, and we have one ventricle with some very thick wall. This actually, if you look on the edge of the clip here, there's a little black spot here. That little black spot is a hypoplastic left heart. This is a baby that has an early aortic atresia. If you have an early aortic atresia, the blood doesn't go into the left ventricle because it cannot get out, and so the left ventricle does not develop. And you know this is what it is because if you look at the permanent body of flap here, you see it's flapping from the left side into the right side. So this is hypoplastic left heart syndrome. This was always confusing to me because I thought in hypoplastic left heart syndrome you would have a hypoplastic left ventricle. And that's not true. You may have an absolute left ventricle, you can have a hypoplastic left ventricle, and you can have a dilated left ventricle. So remember this picture because in the next few slides I will show you the other two forms. 
So here we have another uh, few chambers. We have just one single chamber in the complete form of atrial hypocephalic defect. Here we have another trigospedial atresia with a hyperplastic white ventricle and a uh, ventricocephalic defect. Here we have a trigospedial atresia with ventricocephalic defect, a double inlet single ventricle, and sorry for that. And here we have a left ventricle that does not look normal. First, it's not long enough. Second, it's more round than normal. Third, it has this big white line around it, which is called endocardial fibroelastosis. And I don't have the video clip, but I can tell you that the blood was going from the left atrium to the right atrium, into the right ventricle, to the pulmonary. This is also a hypoplastic left ventricle. And this is now one in which the left ventricle started developing, but could not continue. So I'll show you one with no left ventricle, and this is one with a small left ventricle. Sometimes you may have too many chambers, and all these membranes, I'll show you, can be confused for a chamber. Sometimes you can also have a pericardial cyst. Pericardial cysts are usually at the base of the heart. Now you can also have enlargement of the heart. Here we have a global enlargement, but you may also have an enlargement just of the myocardium. This is increased myocardial thickness, or you can have a bump coming out of the heart, and this is very typical of the cardiac rhabdos, or you can have a cardiac chamber which is enlarged, and typically it's the right atrium that enlarges. Uh, when you see that. So here we have a heart which is much too big. It's much greater than a third of the heart, the chest, and you see the walls are very thick. And if you look under real time, it'll be very sluggish and small contraction. So this is cardiomyopathy. Here we have the FG I've shown you before. Here we have a global enlargement because the heart has to work too hard. If you work harder, the heart is going to enlarge. And this happens in three shots. The venogillian aneurysm, which is the most common, the chorea angioma, the placenta, when they get to be greater than five centimeters, and the hemangioma of the liver, which is least common of the three. Now, sometimes actually you can have obstruction lesions that can cause an enlargement. For instance, aortic calcinosis. This baby here has an aorta which is completely classified, and so it doesn't expand during systole. It's like a fixed pipe. This is like atherosclerosis in all people, but it, it's a which is a more recessive condition, so you can anticipate it. And since the heart does not, since the aorta does not understand, it will increase the resistance, and the baby will develop uh, an enlargement and hydros. Or you may have a tumor to the cord that is tight. One percent of baby have a tumor to the cord. Very few have a tight tumor. So if you see cardiomyopathy, uh, uh, cardiomegaly also look at side of the cord. Sometimes you can have a heart that appears too large, but actually the heart is the normal size, it's the chest that is too small. And this is the critical finding in all the lethal scale dysplasia. If the scale dysplasia is lethal, it is not because the long bones are too short, it's because the ribs did not expand enough to an eye development of the lungs, and so the baby will die of hyperplasia after birth. And something similar happens also in renal genesis and sometimes in some of the cystic kidney disease in which the oligohydrogenous compresses the chest and the heart looks too big compared to the size of the chest. You can have an increased arcadial thickness in the cardiomyopathy. I'll show you one in just a second. In the univentricular heart, remember my first hypoplastic air heart syndrome, they had only two chambers. And in the simple hypertrophy for diabetic mother, they have poor control. If you find a localized enlargement, by far the most common is a cardiac tumors. 60% of cardiac tumors are rhabdos, 60% of rhabdos are associated with tumor sclerosis. So that's the most common. Rarely you can also have more cardiac function, but these are not very common. So if you see a baby that has several echogenic masses in the heart, what you want to do is look at the skin of the mother. And here we are with the cafeola spot on the skin and the angiofibroma also on the skin. This mother actually didn't know she had tuberous clauses, and when you find tuberous clauses, also look in the brain to see she's got some nodules around the ventricle, and look in the kidney to see for the masses in the kidney. 
And the large chamber is usually the right atrium and the long list of differential diagnoses for enlargement of the right atrium. Rarely you will have also a decreased cardiac size, and this is typically due to compression of the heart by some very distended heart, uh, lungs in laryngeal trivia. So here the secretions of the lungs cannot escape of the lungs, the lungs become very enlarged and they compress the heart, the heart function is decreased and the baby goes into high drops. Abnormal cogenicity, these are the cogenic foci. We used to make a big deal about that 20 years ago. They have essentially uh, been abandoned now. Uh, you can find air in field in mice, you can find dystrophic valve. I'll show you that all the trichospedic treasure always present as a wide spot. The mitral treasure do the same. Sometimes you can have invasion of the interventricular septum and the free wall of the left ventricle. This is a fibroma of the heart. This is a rare tumor of the heart, but it will prevent the heart from developing, and this left ventricle is not going to be functioning. And then sometimes you find a baby that has a white line all around the heart. This white line here is called endocardial fibroblastosis. And here you see the left ventricle is very large, but it doesn't have the normal shape. It's not elongated at the normal left ventricle. It's very long. And if you look on the real time, that left ventricle is not acting at all. It's fixed. It's a sphere that is not moving. And if you do card opera, you will see no card opera going to that. So this also is a hyperplastic left heart syndrome, but now with a distended left ventricle. So differentiate between hyperplastic left heart syndrome and the size of the left ventricle can be anything. If you see a black line beside of the heart, especially when it's in the AV groove, think this is a pericardial effusion or pericardial fluid. To me, up to two millimeter is normal. Above 2 mm, think of all this list of disorder, in particular the coach infection. So, in the step 2, we look at the chambers, how they're connected, and the septation begins. Again, nothing very difficult here. Now, in the step 3, we're going to be looking now at the vessels, not far from the heart, like we did in the first segment, but we're going to look at them right at the heart. And what we want to make sure is that the aura is arising from the left ventricle. We want to see the continuity of the aura with the anterior effect of the mitral valve and the atrial septum. Remember, that's what we do the left after trivial. We want to make sure there's no subaortic ventricle septal defect. And then we look at the pulmonary artery, and you want to make sure it comes from the right ventricle, and it crosses over the aura. Very important. Then we we'll compare the one and the other. They have to have a similar size. You want to see the confluence of the aura and the pulmonary, and that confluence has to be on the left side of the trachea in the posterior major spine, and there should be no extra vessels. And then we we'll look at the veins, the pulmonary veins, and the systemic veins. So, if we take the aura as the landmark at 100 percent, pulmonary can be up to 20 percent bigger. The other measurements are not very critical. So here we have the left upper track, and this is obtained in systole or diastole. Let it run together. Systole or diastole. What is this white dot? The only valve, the, the only valve is in the middle of the aura. It is closed. If it's closed, it is diastole. Okay? Catch all the information out of the image. And we want to see this continuity between the two. Here again, here again. Systole, diastole. Now, when you look at the left outflow chart, you want to see several centimeters of the ascending aura. And the reason for that is that from time to time you'll see a bifurcation here. You'll see this aura divided into two vessels, the right and the left pulmonary. And so then you don't have the aura, you actually have the pulmonary artery. And if you have the pulmonary arising from the left ventricle, you have the detransposition. So always look for several centimeters of the uh, aortic arch. This is the area for the dimension to you before. 
Now, when you do an M mode at this level, you can get an interesting image called the Eolic box. So, if you magnify here, you have the cusps for the aura that are close to you and isolate. And then, very abruptly, they open up here during the onset of systole. They stay open on the side of the vessel and then they close here. So, this here is called the Eolic box. It's also a measure of the ejection time of the heart. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the PR interval. So here we have a very different aortic valve. I'll show you some aortic valve where a little white dot inside the aorta. Here we have a big white line. That is not a normal valve. This is a thickened aortic valve. And it's not opening properly. During the system, it domes, it makes a curve. There's a thin jet that goes through that. If I put cardiopera here, what kind of color would I see? Every color. You'll see the acid that goes on a high velocity jet. Here we have another example with a bicuspid uric valve. Very common anomaly. Actually, Leonardo da Vinci was the first one to diagnose that. And the daughter of one of my son roughly has a bicuspid uric valve. So if you see the aura, and the aura has a foot on both ventricles, you see the leg of the ballerina is broken. This is an overriding aura. This is a severe PSD. This is very typical of the trilogy of failure. Okay, so easy to recognize. And the break in the leg of the ballerina. Another example, overriding of the aura, overriding of the aura. Think about common arterial form and some of the double outlet right ventricle could also do that. Now, this is a dangerous image. Is this a ventricle defect? Is this a tetrasia failure? Or is this a normal exam? Who says this is normal? Who says this is abnormal? Okay, not too many. So, it could be one of two things. It could be that this is an overriding aorta, or it could be this is a crisscrossing of the pulmonary and the aorta. And how do you do one from the other? Well, you want to change the angle of the view. You want to make a good left alpha track, and then you see with cardiopathy that these two vessels, this one pulmonary is in red, and it goes from the blue to the red through black. So these are not touching each other. What happened here, is that my section was just on the undersurface of the pulmonary. This is just the bottom of the pulmonary, and so it returns and no echo. And here I have corrected the section and I moved it down below. So be careful about that because this gives you a lot of false ventricular defect. This is a common reason for overreading them, and you have to do a card out with this image to make sure that this is correct or not. So be careful with this image. Now here we have left alpha chart. It goes into the aura, and surprise, surprise, this aura is dividing in two vessels. The aura should not be doing that. This is not the aura, this is the pulmonary. And so this is not a, a, a normal left eye for chart. This is a detransposition of the great artery. Here we have the three vessel view, and you see the alignment of the vessels over here. And uh, it should be almost touching uh, normally. And you see the position of the thymus here in front of the three vessel view. Now, look at this one here, very different. We have a uh, pulmonary which is too narrow. You see the aura is much larger than the pulmonary. This is what happens in the trilogy of Fredo or in pulmonary treasure, for instance. Or here we have just the opposite. We have a massively distended pulmonary. The two branches of the pulmonary are very distended compared to the aura. This is the absent pulmonary valve syndrome. And all of called absent pulmonary valve syndrome. You see the pulmonary valve is there, it's just completely uh, effaced and it did not develop. And so there's complete regurgitation at this level. Remember, I showed you that you can go from this view by changing a little bit to the uh, double arch view over here. And you can see in this view, you should have the two vessels of the same size, and they all should go on the left side of the trach. Here you would have. Right next to bronchus, left next to bronchus. Here, on the other hand, we have a large pulmonary in a very thin aura. So the aura is very small, and you can see that it is not posterior to the line that I described to you when we're talking about the three vessel view, think about quartation of the aura, 
people are hyperplasia, they were hyperplastic of heart syndrome, and so on and so forth. Here, again, we have a large pulmonary, and the aorta that is very small, again, hyperplastic of heart syndrome, and you see that the aorta is in trees compared to this line that we described earlier. This is the opposite. Now we have a thin pulmonary and a large aorta, and this is what we have in Detroit of Fallu. Here we have an aorta that is slightly ahead of this line, and this is a more benign form of Detroit of Fallu also. Here we have an aorta that is not connecting with the ductus, and it's very small on the three vessel view. This is an interrupted aortic arch of the George syndrome. We look for the ABC classification. Now here we have just one single great vessel coming out with a small pulmonary arising from the side. This is a truncus, and if you do card opera, it will look like a hand with a thumb coming to the side of the hand. Here we have only one vessel, and this is the D or the L transposition. Here we have no tricuspid valve, so no right ventricle. So we also will have only one vessel because the pulmonary is not going to uh, be forming. Now here we have a three vessel view that has four vessels. On the left side of the pulmonary, we see another vessel which is the resistant left supracheal. When you see that, you have to see where it drains uh, and look at the coronary sinus to see the side of the coronary sinus. Here you can see the persistent left supernicator behind the left atrium. Here we have the three vessel view, we have the trachea over there, and we have the acidus over here, and there behind, remember, is the esophagus, normal finding. Here we have a baby in which the left outflow tract has a division here. There's a rapid division of the tube. This is a double aortic arch. Maybe they have double aortic arch has a right arch and a left arch, and very typically the right arch is bigger than the left arch. This baby will be surgery corrected probably by interrupting the left arch to release the sling over the trachea. Here we have the uh, three vessel view with the trachea between the pulmonary and the aorta. It gives this image here very different from what you see normally. And remember, this is the drawing that I showed you before with the double. Now sometimes you have the two vessels in parallel, as you can see over here. So this is transposition of the great artery, very different from what you see in the left half of the track. So here we have the aortic arch, and underneath the aortic arch, much thinner here, we have the pulmonary arch. Okay, we have the ductal arch over here. Now notice that both the aorta and the pulmonary are arising from the right ventricle. So we have a double outflow double outlet by ventricle, and we have a transposition of the great arteries at the same time. Here we have the left ventricle going to a vessel, and that vessel is dividing very rapidly. Typically, the length of the pulmonary is only about two or three times diameter, so that complicates the repair of those transposition of the great arteries. And when you make a cross section at the level here, we have the the aura and the water, you see the two vessels side by side, something you cannot get in the normal fetus. Here we have some sort of a complicated situation. We're looking at the outflow trap, and then we have this image here. What is this image here? It looks like a chromosome almost. And when I put a video clip, you see that this is the ductus, and the ductus joins into the aura here. This is called a ductal aneurysm. It's not really an aneurysm, it's just an elongation of the ductus. And you see this from time to time. And this is another example. It looks like we have a piece of zinc point inside the chest. And when you put card opera, there's a lot of fluid to that. Again, this is a ductal aneurysm. Now, this is usually benign, and the baby correct self, self correct after delivery, but it can be associated with connective tissue disorder. So, this baby need to be checked after birth. Another example with a three vessel view. And you see that the pulmonary, instead of being a line here, is a long sinus curve going over here. You see this part. So this, again, a ductal aneurysm. Here you can see pulmonary vein returning to the left atrium. This is what it's supposed to be doing. 
here's your boom wave drain return behind the lift nature, but not connected to the lift nature. You go to a vessel here, and then your task is to see whether this vessel is going south into the river or north into the uh, innominate vein. Another old image of a supervision cable that receives a vessel coming from the right upper load and then it was its return into the supervision cable. And then look at the systemic veins, and so we're going to be looking at the super and inferior cable, and I'll show you the example here of that uh, inferior cable. So what is this vessel? I'll let you think for 30 seconds. Okay, who says this is Dr. Osh? Raise your hand. Who says Yurik Osh? Raise your hand. Okay, 100% of you think this is neither the ductal arch or the uric arch? What is it? As it goes? What color? Red. Red goes towards the transducer or away from the transducer? It goes towards the transducer. So the blood flow here is going this way. Okay? Important. What blood flow does that? As it goes on. So this is baby that has left isomerism with intrapid IVC. So be careful, always use all the clue in your image. Don't just say, oh, oh, this is a red arch, it has to be the aura. This is not the aura at all. If you have a baby that comes from a nucleolucency screening 13 weeks, and you make a coral section of the chest, and you see two, are two vessels in the chest, one red and one blue, what is the diagnosis? You have a 14 week fetus, you make a coral section of the chest, you see two long vessels, one red, one blue. What's the diagnosis? Same thing, left isomerism. One is the aura, and the other one is the acidus vein. Only the acidus vein is visible there. So, even by 14 weeks, you can anticipate the diagnosis. Okay, so use all the information you have in your diagnosis. So in the step three, what we did is, first look at the aura, or the landmark of the aura, then look at the pumari, see that it crosses the aura, and it has the same size. Then we look at the comparison between the aura and the pumari, and finally we look at the pumari vein. Okay? With that, you have a complete examination of the heart. Now, I have a fourth step, and the fourth step is much, much longer, and I'll give you just the first few minutes of it. And this is the assessment of the rhythm. So, for those of you who have a musical ear, what is the music here? What is the song? What is the tune? Deep breath. No. Anyone? No one reads music here. I don't read music either, but you can see that you have three of the same level and then one go down. And then you have three of the same level and then one go down. This is the fifth one, fifth symphony of Beethoven. I was in uh, in Russia, and one of the women not only says the fifth symphony, but she could say the fifth, the fifth wife. The reason I want to show you that is that a very simple tracing carries a lot of information. So, so, sorry, let me come back home here. I missed something. This is a patient at 36 weeks and 3 days. The heart rate is 138 beats per minute. Normal or abnormal? Normal. 
everything is normal, but you're right, this is abnormal. I'll show you why. Is this heart rate too fast or too slow? to listen to that whole course there, huh? So normal heart rate decreases from 160 beat to 150 beat uh, during the gestation. We talk about tachycardia when it's greater than 180, and we talk about bradycardia when it's less than 110 beats per minute. It used to be less than 100 beats per minute. That was changed a few years ago, about five, six years ago, 210 beats per minute. And then you have the irregular heartbeat. So there's several things we have to look at. And the reason we have to pay attention to the arrhythmia is that they can lead to consistent heart failure. And if you have a baby that has high drops and an AV block, this is usually a fatal outcome. So you have to detect those babies because some of these AV block can be corrected prenatally and it's important to recognize these. Some of these babies have associated anatomical anomaly, particularly atrial septal defect, atrial microcephal defect both markets for wives and the market control valve and numbers. So these babies have to be identified also. And then I hate to tell you that but the most common is premature atrial contraction, supraventricular tachycardia, and atrial ventricle block. But I want you to forget that because I want you to make the distinction between all the arrhythmia, not just spit out a number. So these are the conduction pathways. The, uh, the sinoatrial node produce the impulse. The impulse travels through Backman's bundle from the right atrium to the left atrium, so both atria are contracted at the same time. And then while this is, is happening, there are three internal tracts that transfer the impulse to the atrial vertical rail, and then there's a little delay here, and then it travels into the right and left bundle part. So this is the conduction pathway. Now, <coughs> this is an EKG, and you remember the EKG, the distance between Two big red lines here is 200 milliseconds. Now, five big red lines is one second. This on the EKG tracing is called the P wave, and this is the QRS, which is abbreviated to R because three letters is too long to pronounce. On our side, we have the same setting between two small tick marks, we have 200 milliseconds. This is a small tick. In the big tick mark, we have one second. If we could not all machine do that, for instance, here's a machine that has one second for the big tick mark, but it has 500 milliseconds for the small tick marks. Now, this is a fetus that was scanned in 84, and I wanted to ask you whether this heart rate is known or too slow. How do you do that? Well, very simple. You look at the tick marks here, and if it had a beat every tick mark, it would have a beat every 200 milliseconds. So for each second, it would have five beats. Okay? So for each uh, minute, it would have 60 times five beats. It would have 300 beats per minute. So if a beat occurred every tick mark, you would have a rhythm of 300 beats per minute. If the beat occurred every two tick marks, it'd be 150 beats per minute. If it occurred every three tick marks, it'd be 100 beats per minute. And I'm sure that when you were in the internship, you remember the EKG rule of the lines 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50 beats per minute. This is a little song that everyone has in their mind at some point. So this baby here is about 110 beats per minute, so just at the limit of bradycardia. Now, what is the heart rate in this baby? You look at the big tick marks, the small tick marks, and I will not give you the answer. You have to download the lecture and you have to make the exercise on your own. Very simple answer. So, here we have some tracing that we get typically. We have here a tracing of the left ventricle inflow outflow. This is the ductus venosus tracing, and this is the supranic cava, inferior cava, or the pedic plane tracing. What is the name of this wave here? Okay, don't be shy. It's a letter in Vietnamese E. How about this one? A. And this one? B. The 
this is the ventricular systole. <coughs> now, interestingly enough, what is this little peak here before? This little one here, just before E. E represents the early diastolic filling. So this is just the beginning of diastole. So what is the event in the heart just before diastole? It's systole. And what is the heart of systole right before diastole? It is the end of systole. The baby has squeezed the blood into the aura. It's moving into the aura. And then no more pressure, it comes back and it closes the aortic valve. And this is the semi valve closure over here. Okay? So this is a, cl a click that tells you this is the aortic valve closure. And similarly, what is this click here? This is just before systole. This is the beginning of systole. The ventricle is contracting, and the first thing that happens before pressure can build up is that the AV valve closes. And this makes a snapping sound, and this is the AV valve closure. So this is diastole, this is systole, and here's a bunch of systole and diastole. So try to identify the tracing what you're looking at. So EA, this is the cellular valve closure, this is the atrioventricular valve closure, and this is V. So here we have two complete cardiac cycle, and actually this is more detail you can see. Here I told you is the atrioventricular the, uh, uh, cellular valve closure. Between the cellular valve closure and the E wave, you have a little gap here. That little gap here in between is the isofolemic ventricular uh, relaxation. So the heart pressure is decreasing, but not enough yet so that the AV valve open and then the AV valve open. So this is isophonic relaxation time. And on the opposite here, you have the AV valve that have closed, but the pressure is not hard enough to overcome the pressure in the aorta. And this is the isophonic contraction time. Okay, so and the time index, which is a measurement of the efficiency of the ventricle, is the distance between this and this here minus this. So this is a lot of information to try to get. So when we do some demonstration, I want you to look at the tracing and not get some sort of weekly line where you can measure the heart rate, that is not sufficient. I want you to try to get E, A, V, and this two uh, tracing. So V is for ventricular systole, E wave, A wave, and I was in Mongolia, and in Mongolia there's this cute little camel called the Bactrian camel. And remember the Bactrian camel has two bumps. This is the V wave, this is the E wave, and this is the A wave. So I asked you to find in my tracing where is the camel. Now, if you look at the tracing here, the onset of A until the closure of the similar valve is the equivalent of the PR interval. This is actually properly called the AV interval, AV in ultrasound, PR in electrophysiology, essentially the same, but so you know the two things. So you can measure the AV or the PR interval very well in the inflow outflow chart. If the doctor's venosa, you can't. It's just the inflection of the curve here, the inflection of the curve there. This is not something we're going to be using. And if you look at the vena cava, very interestingly, not only you can recognize the onset very well, but you can see that the E wave and the A wave are in opposite direction. Remember, this is obtained in the ventricle, so E is filling into the same direction as A. So E and A are in the same direction in the ventricle, but when you look at the cava, let's assume that I'm in the uh, entrance of the super cava into the atrium. Well, during E, I'm going to go drop into the atrium, into the ventricle, but during A, I'm going to be pushed back into the brain. So E and A are in opposite direction when you look at the cava, while they're in the same direction in the ventricle. So this is very useful because sometimes, if you have a too fast fiber, for instance, E and A will be merging in the ventricle, and you have a way to distinguish them over here. So this is useful to have. Now, if you want to measure the P to P interval, any place, if you want to measure the R to R interval, again, the ventricle inflow outflow, and the K value is useful, but the ductus venosus is not useful for that. So these are the ones we're going to be concentrated on. Now, where can you measure the PR interval? 
Well, to measure the PR interval, you need an error in which a signal can capture both a systolic event and a diastolic event at the same time. And for that, there are typically four locations. One, you can take a beam that goes into the left ventricle for heart flow, and it goes uh, into the ascending aorta, so you have this left ventricle heart flow. Or you can take an aorta and supervena cava, because the beam here, you can capture both at the same time, and you will have venous signal on one side, arterial signal on the other side, or you can go anywhere in the pulmonary circulation, because almost anywhere you have a pulmonary and the aura step side by side, and you'll be able to get the tube flow. Now, sometimes you have babies that are really obstinate and they have their arms around their chest and you can't get anything, and then you can try to do the pool technique of going into the distant aura and inferior the cava. It's not quite as pretty. So, this is what we're going to be looking at. So, I'm running out of time. Let, let me give you just a few more images on that and then we'll stop. If you have a baby whose heart rate is too fast, above 160 beats per minute, there will not be time for the passive filling of the ventricle. And then E and A are progressively going to merge and you have a monophasic wave instead of a diaphasic wave. The same thing happened with the maturity of contraction. So, here we have the superior cava in aorta. You take a large sample, that R and superior cava here, and you use one gate, and then you get a tracing of this. And here is the camel. So you see V, E, and A. V, E, and A. And you see A being on the other side is easy to recognize. From the middle, you, you go for the gap, and you measure the gap over here. On the other sides, you have only the high tracing, and so the PR interval is measured over here. Um, really a bit prep for time, but here again, another camel, you see V, E, and A, so you can measure over here. In the pulmonary vein, you just get an only sample, and I don't like that because it's so irregular, you just take a big sample like this, and then the camel in the pulmonary vein is not quite as pretty, it has a lot of flat back. Uh, but again, you can see the V, E, and A, and so the gap here is the A, so you can measure the PR interval this way. And then let me show you uh, another one here, which is the left inflow and outflow. And this is the one you most likely to start with. You take the ballerina foot, put your sample below the mitral valve and then you get this. This is a tracing that has all the information, all the clicks that you want to look at, and the advantage is that you can measure this very early in the gestation. You can measure that already in the ninth week, and you can see those measurements already in the ninth week. Now, let me, I'm going to skip there because I don't have enough time. What I wanted to show you is that at whatever gestation age you measure this, Whichever technique you measure it to, that PR interval has to be less than 150 milliseconds. If it's 140, you risk it three days later. If it's above 150 milliseconds, then the patient most likely has either lupus or she has a autoimmune disorder. And these are babies that can be treated merely, and these baby can be recovered. So unfortunately, I'm out of time here. But I really would like to urge you to download this lecture and go for it several times until you have all this information. It's very practical, very step-by-step. Step. You will not become a compiologist after the lecture, but you will be able to do a lot of good for your patient. You will certainly be able to recognize what is a normal baby from a baby that needs to go to the tertiary center. And that is the most important thing you can do, because if someone doesn't detect a baby has an anomaly, no cardiologist will ever see that and that baby will have to be treated after birth. And maybe they are transferred in an ambulance versus transferred in amniotic fluid, don't have the same outcome. So I would urge you to go inside this lecture, and tomorrow we'll look at some of the cardiac anatomy. Thank you very much.
Như vậy là phần lý thuyết của chúng ta đã xong.